Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Australian Institute of Landscapes Architect and Wood Solutions webinar on wood specification and use in external applications, our second webinar. In the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and we acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship of country and forests. We pay our respects to elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. My name's Alistair Woodard. I'm part of the uh, Wood Solutions technical team, and uh, it's my pleasure to facilitate this series of webinars over uh, this, this five weeks, this being the second one in the series. I won't um, speak too much today about Wood Solutions, because a lot of you online um, probably heard me speak about this in more detail last week. But um, Wood Solutions is an industry initiative that's funded through our uh, Forest and Wood Products Australia. It, it really is there for building professionals, for landscape architects such as yourselves, for engineers, designers. What we want to do is inspire you to use wood and, and wood products, and if so, uh, provide you with the right information and resources to delay to do that successfully. We undertake a range of activities, including events such as today with our webinars and also face-to-face -face seminars. Um, we sponsor the major organisations, do in-house tutorials, produce a whole range of different uh, technical information, and all of that can be uh, found under our woodsolutions.com.au website. So I'll encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't already. Uh, under the website, if you want to see what events um, we undertake, there's a tab at the top there to, to, that uh, specifies that. And uh, um, there you can find the links to these other um, webinars in this series. So if you haven't registered for the ones coming up, you can certainly do so at that point. Also, um, just reminding you that all the webinars that we produce are recorded. So if you want to see this webinar again or the other ones that we produced, either type webinars in the search function or click under the resources tab under the webinar link there. And that will give you sort of access to the webinars that uh, that we've done. So these webinars or um, specifically these ALA ones will be posted under a special section shortly. But there's a whole range of webinars that uh, we've done over the last couple of years, particularly since COVID, probably over 80 or more that you might find there of interest as well. So just a little bit of a reminder about interacting with um, today's webinar. Uh, if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves, certainly do that using the chat function and use that all panelists and attendees uh, um, uh, link there. But more importantly, we're very keen to get your questions for the um, uh, for the speakers today at the end of the of the, the, the webinar. We've got about 10 minutes allowed for Q&A. And then usually we get some really good questions coming on these webinar sessions. So don't be shy. Um, post your questions as uh, as you think of them as we go through the presentations today, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hold we'll hold that uh, webinar Q and A session at the end. Also, a reminder that you can get um, uh, CPD points for these webinars, so a certificate of completion will be sent out at the end of the webinar. It usually comes out within a week. Most of you hopefully should have received your one from last week if you attended. Just a reminder, if you don't see that in your normal mail, just have a look in your junk mail folder. Sometimes it might end up there. And please store those certificates in a safe place because we really can't reissue those. I mean, we've got 180 people registered for this event. Uh, we had about that many last week. So it is difficult for the team if they have to, to reissue those. So please hang on to them. So um, this week we're doing some case studies using some of your AILA members, which is really exciting, showcasing some of the innovative use of timber. And I'd like just to introduce our presenters today. Firstly, um, Jerry de Grice, who's a founding director of Inspiring Place, a Tasmanian-based consultancy that offers a unique blend of skills across landscape architecture, tourism, recreation, environmental management, and community engagement. With over 40 years of practice, Jerry has developed a deep understanding of the dynamic interactions between the physical, biological, and social process that influences the landscape. At the heart of Jerry's work is a commitment to the shaping of a sustainable future filled with healthy and diverse natural and built landscapes that support resilient communities. Jerry will be sharing his design philosophies today and, and also how these influence the design of the beautiful award-winning lily pads projects at the Royal Tasmanian Botanic Gardens. Our second speaker will be Luke Smith. Luke leads the Arab architecture team in New South Wales and ACT. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Nottingham and a Master's in Architecture from the Royal College of Art in the UK. Prior to joining the Arab Landscape Architecture team four years ago, Luke was a senior architect with Hassel Architecture. Luke and his Arab team tackle a wide range of major community and city shaping projects, all of which provides a multitude of social, health and environmental and economic benefits for the local communities they serve. Luke will share with us today Arab's approach to design, discussing the terrible boardwalk and rock pool, an award-winning project designed and inspired by nature, 
and there's a um, tangential extension to the natural coastline of, uh, along which it runs. So a couple of great presenters today. So without further ado, I might hand over to Jerry. I'll just stop sharing my screen here. And I'll start sharing mine. Uh, we on, Alistair? Uh, just on your um, desktop, so not on the presentation. Wrong one. Okay, wrong screen. Uh, stop sharing, start sharing. There we go. How's that? That's it. Beautiful. Thanks for that. Great. Thanks, uh, Alistair. Um, I'd like to, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm lucky to live in Wichita, Tasmania, the land of the Palawa people, and want to express my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd also want to thank Wood Solution and Alistair for the opportunity to speak to you today. What I'm going to run through today is, an is take the opportunity to recognize my elders and my contemporaries who have affected my understanding of the use of wood as a design material, and then discuss how their influences are playing out in the practice set an inspiring place. To begin with, I want to put it out there that I'm just a kid from Detroit, uh, land of the woodland cultures and later the tribes of the Potawatomi and the Huron. As a kid from Detroit, when I say that, you might think of a number of things. You might think of the Motor City, you might think of the Motown music, or you might think of the ruin porn of the news cycle. But I grew up in a street lined with elms that ran to infinity, and which inspired my love of trees. I'll also admit the only thing I ever did with wood when I was young was play baseball with my baseball bat. What I didn't know then, but I do know now, is that Detroit's roots go deeper than cars and music to a history of pre-Columbian forests and forest living, and later the forestry industry. At its beginning, in the 1600s, the first French settler Cadillac described Detroit as having forests and water as being so beautiful that it may justify being called earthly paradise, the earthly paradise of North America. What kind of forest was Cadillac looking at? Amongst other forest types, there were hundreds of thousands of hectares of dry music woodlands across the state of Michigan, filled with giant white pines. Annie Prue described the discovery of these forests by white explorers in her novel, Barkskins. The characters exclaimed, big white pines were everywhere, thicker and thicker. As we traveled, we found it more and more choice pine forests than any of us had ever seen. A pure stand of huge trees, 1.5 meters in diameter, the tiered branches resembling great green pagodas, 60 meters in height, and more of the prized fine-grained wood, 60 cubic meters to the half hectare. The greatest stand of white pine in the world, in fact, forests so thick and trees so mighty, it was thought that it would take a thousand men, a thousand years to log. In reality, in these, this an example here, in reality, Rather than a thousand years, in the 60 years between 1840 and 1900, most of those forests were gone. Old growth forests in the wider Great Lakes region dwindled from 68% of its original extent to 6%. Of this, only 0.2% remains in Michigan. The dry music forests of the previous map becoming one of the rarest vegetation types in the Great Lakes states. In Michigan, 0.25 remains of the vast pre-settlement distribution of white pine. The rest are degraded remnants throughout its original range, replaced by birch and aspen for pulp and deer habitat. As Michigan was the leading lumber producer in the US during this time, these white pines became the timber houses which spread across the state, a single mature tree providing enough lumber for five three bedroom houses. The state also became a fine furniture manufacturing hub. This later skill gave rise to the opportunity to build carriages, which in turn became car bodies, the fit out of which has morphed into the cars of today. Interestingly, one of the indicators of a luxury car is its inclusion of timber elements in its interior. I'd like to say that all this timber influenced and these forests influenced my career, but apart from camping trips into the remnants of the woods and the inspiration from these trips to live a life outdoors, these trip, there was little other bearing on my life as a landscape architect. My dad wasn't particularly helpful in teaching me anything either. Inadvertently, the only thing I learned from him about wood was to swear when it hit your finger with a hammer. Thus, at the end of my time in Detroit, I remained a city boy with full, few wood skills. My route into the profession as part was yet to come. 
in late high school and in early, and as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, I became aware of the environmental crises of our time, burning rivers, dead lakes, the loss and endangerment of species, toxic sites, and air pollution, et cetera. All this was talked about at the first Earth Day in 1969, and I'd like to think that that's me in the front row having lucked out and being on campus on that seminal day. The experience of Earth Day, though, influenced me to enroll in the School of Natural Resources, which had a long history of teaching forestry, towards which the course was skewed. In my degree, I learned to measure the height of a tree through stereoscopic interpretation, calculate the volume of, volume of harvests for pulp and board feed for timber, but I was also introduced to ecology, woody plants, natural history interpretation, conservation policy and recreation and regional planning. Areas that were far more interesting to me and about which I was more academically suited. Importantly, my commitment to environmental action grew in this pre-ESD era. On graduation in 1974, I moved west to Minnesota with its tripartite landscape of savanna in the southeast, tall grass prairie in the southwest, and pine forests in the north. Through this, I gained my first exposure to the aspects of design and construction with wood, and was inspired by the artistic genius of Herb Baldwin here on the right, and te the technical industry of wizardry of Jim Robin, who was pioneering the use of timber in the construction of playgrounds and other elements, unlike any that had been seen up to that time. Some examples, this is some work of Herb on a residential project in Southeast Minnesota. Beautifully crafted, beautifully skilled, skillful use of timber in a variety of forms. This is some work by Jim uh, at a subdivision with a, you know, where he's created a diving board from timber. A plant, one of the plan, many plans we drew in those days of these various playgrounds to give you a sense of the scale and the interconnectivity of play elements that's become a feature of uh, playground design today. And this is just one of the many uh, timber structures that we, we built over the time that I was working with Jim. Uh, of course, this is all pre-metal uh, pre and plastic playgrounds. It's also uh, on well before any kind of safety standards uh, came into existence. So there's a lot of things wrong with that, uh, that playground in, in, in today's terms. Uh, it's just the culmination of Herb and Jim's collaboration and friendship was the construction of Herb's timber home on the edge of the Minnesota River Valley. Despite their teaching, my own skills remained as, as a working with wood as were gross of nature. I was able to cut a creosoted railroad tie and pound a six inch spike, but any subtlety in the crafting of wood still eluded me. With my bachelor's in 1979, I moved to Melbourne University, 81 to 84, where I sometimes studied and was also a part-time rat bag greening. I arrived in Tasmania post Franklin River blockade in 1984 to live and work as a landscape architect. Tasmania was attractive because of its wild landscapes and its extensive diverse forests. That map in the, in the upper left-hand corner being a map of all the forest reproduction areas of, uh, in Tasmania. At the time I arrived, Barry McNeil was leading the School of Environmental Studies, an experimental teaching program based on the idea of learning by doing. Barry inspired what us with his own architectural practice and its emphasis on construction systems. And these are a couple of examples. This is Barry's house under construction up on Mount Nelson. Um, and you can see here some of his uh, techniques of creating light, lightweight structures using uh, both window frames and the roofing iron as structural elements to reduce the need for the sizable timbers that might otherwise be used. Uh, this is his uh, the, the, Bruni, the, the Alana Hall on Bruni Island, South Bruni Island. And this is his boathouse at his home uh, shack at Bruni Island North. And again, you can see, he was particularly interested in the treatment of end grains uh, with, with various materials to protect uh, so that he could use pine as a construction material. One of the other things that Barry did was he introduced us to guest, uh, guest lecturers like Richard Laplastria. And here you see his Angophora house, beautifully crafted using timber in a variety of modes, and his own home at Lovett's Bay. One of the outcomes of the course was this building, which was the Wombat Pavilion in the Royal Tasmanian Botanic Gardens, which was designed by Richard and a team of students as a demountable structure 
wherein all the various pieces could be reused if necessary, so that the whole the whole construction could be undone and put back together in a different form. Amongst uh, Barry's protégés and students was a, my friend and colleague, David Trevally, with whom I've eventually worked on multiple projects through my then practice as Jerry de Grice Proprietor Limited. In this work that David, David did the technical crafting of the wood products while I worked on the strategic master planning and management end of the projects. I was doing the planning for life outside while David was creating the up and creating the opportunity for David to do the design for life outside. Some of the projects we worked on included this forestry manual, uh, which was to be a kit of parts for use in all the forestry reserves around Tasmania. Uh, the key element in that kit of parts was this post that David crafted that could be used in various forms as either a ridge, uh, ridge post for uh, shelters or as a signage structure to be cut off, could become a bollard, could become a leg for a, a table or a chair or as a seat, as part of a bench element. Uh, my role was to work out how to apply this kit of parts across the recreation op opportunity spectrum from road and modified to primitive, and then to uh, how to apply that kit of parts within various forest types. So that, because things would change, you might need more shelter in a rainforest than you did in a dry square fill forest. Then um, we managed to get two prototypes built. This was one of the shelters. Again, you can see the lightweight construction in the roofing using the iron as a structural element. This was in a rainforest setting or a wet forest setting, so you could see the overhangs to give protection to the flooring. Um, and here we have the uh, one of the toilet blocks uh, under uh, that, that's been completed. Another project we worked on was the Hollybank Forestry Training Center. Here, the use of timber was much more uh, subdued in quantity, but more uh, emphasis was on the quality of how it was used. So in this uh, timber, timber door frame, the way it's shaped, shaped around the door handle to suggest uh, a location in space and interior uh, plywood elements were used, but the, the pegs that held it in place were uh, red myrtle. Uh, so exquisite use of an exquisite material rather than a gross uh, use of, of material, a material that has a much higher value. Uh, and then just one more building of David's. This was his um, design center in Launceston, where he worked with Richard Laplastria, the two of them as a team again. And you can see this quite elegant use of timber as um, in, the, in the window settings and in the door frames. Another inspiration for me was my friend and fellow Detroit boy, Peter Adams, who's an acclaimed sculptor. Peter originally came to Tasmania as a, a, to teach in the university's School of Fine Design and eventually left to set up a property called Windgrove on the Tasman Peninsula, where he pursues sculptural interests in working with wood and stone. Jump forward and John Hepper and I merge our practices to, and continue our working in strategic master planning and recreation, tourism and land management, but always underpinned by sustainability and ecological principles with a foray into design, with forays into design, including early WSUD, and an emphasis on indigenous flora. Around the year 2000, however, a growing staff push, began pushing for a greater role of design in the practice. And the opportunities soon emerged that were taking the knowledge we'd gained from land management and ecology into the designs. Still little, however, was, little timber was used. We explored instead the use of modular recycled uh, plastic materials, such as in this award-winning project at Kangaroo Bay. Uh, and in this project, uh, residence up on Mount Nelson, where the decking was modular plastic as well. With the GFC, the team composition changed through layoffs and rehires, and a new group of talented young people came into the practice, all trained at the University of Tasmania, inspired by their studies at the Center for Sustainability in Wood, with its continued emphasis on what Barry said called was learning by doing. The new team all have a shared dedication to sustainability, and all have a passion for design and the use of timber. No mention is made anymore of recycled plastic. The focus has become well and truly on the use of wood as the material of choice in our design work. Despite similar training, each of the team brings a different approach to the use of timber. Jordan, here on the second right, has his family roots is in fine furniture, but he also has a wide world view that he brings to his designs. Uh, Edwina, second left, brings a focused approach that is expressed in beautifully crafted design strategies and Adam 
brings his background in prefabrication of furniture and building. Early in this time, uh, we paid a visit to Chris Sawyer and Susie Kumar's practice at site offices, site office to speak with them about their award-winning uh, multiple projects. I suggested this trip as I believe site office do some of the best work with timber in Australia. The trip was inspirational. It was an inspirational opportunity to look at projects that should inspire the best practice in the use of wood by any landscape architect. For our part, two projects, uh, the lily pads and fern tree are worth noting. The lily pads started as a competition to design a replacement for this aging, uh, poorly crafted treated pine deck at the lily pond. And as director, I offered the young team the opportunity to run, run the competition without any influence from me. Ed sketch inspired the thinking that captured the imagination of the gardens for the design and construction of this nationally award-winning project. And here's a few slides of the, of the deck under construction. You can see these pads are aimed at, uh, we, we couldn't have any bearing, uh, put any holes in the bottom of the pond. This is a deck under construction with some of the weatherproofing of the, uh, I guess you'd call those uh, joists. Uh, and there's the deck in its completion, as you've seen in many of the uh, publications and in use for various parties. Uh, and I have to say that while the deck is beautiful in its own right, it also gains great benefit from its location in the gardens. Uh, some of the construction technique. And I think it's important to note here that the, the team that built the deck included a wood, uh, included a uh, boat builder in, in its team, which gave it, uh, which helped with some of the craftsmanship. And here it is in event mode, inspiring place celebrating its 20th anniversary about five years ago. Another project is our work at Fern Tree Park, where we've developed a uh, custom built play structure using timber as its main, uh, main uh, resource, main material. Um, it's set in a beautiful location with many advanced trees uh, that, that inspired the use of, of timber. And you can see that the uh, kids enjoy the opportunity to play there. I think this is just an ordinary day, not the opening day, which uh, would have had a lot more people at it. But also, because there are a number of very large trees that had to come down uh, due to safety reasons in the park, we were able to use uh, pieces of that timber to create some alternative little play elements for kids to, to uh, roam through and work on depending on their level of ability. And this one in particular, we use some of the round large logs to create a little uh, climbing element that uh, seems to get a lot of engagement. And then, leaving the, the stumps as elements and uh, introducing some carving into them, but also timber through the use of the furniture uh, as well. And then uh, you can see one of the carvings that the, one of the arts people did in the project. We continue to use wood. This is an example of uh, some work with liminal architecture at Dominic College, where they've used wood extensively in their uh, cladding for the building. And we've used wood throughout the design of this place playground. Uh, again, some of these uh, different elements in, in it, different ways of using it as a, as a gross form and as a refined form, uh, again, as a gross form here. And then more recently in the reconstruction of a, a John Patrick garden down at Battery Point, uh, where we've replaced an aging uh, timber deck with a new deck and a stone surround repaired a lot of retaining walls and and started the work of replanting. In passing the torch now to our kids, as John and I call them, I believe John and I are leaving a legacy of commitment to social and ecological regeneration as a basis for strategic uh, and a strong basis in strategic planning and land management to support our roles as landscape architects in the planning and design for life outside. In doing so, John, Adam, Ed, and the rest of the team are furthering the sustainability of the practices across all areas uh, in a regenerative way, wherein wood is a defining material of construction. I close with this slide here, which is the first slide I ever took in Tasmania, and I leave it to you to take up the challenge of using wood in your practice in a manner commensurate with the beauty of the forest from which it comes. 
And I offer a quote from historian Howard Zinn to ponder when he said, don't wait for a grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. By the way, uh, and thank you. So thank you for today. And by the way, I still can't drive a nail straight, but I, I ran into Richard Laplastria on the weekend and he said it was all right because we shouldn't be using nails anyways. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, Jerry. Just before you jump off that slide, and I would remind people we're really keen to get some questions for the Q&A session at the end, so please add those into the Q&A box down there and we'll, we'll get to those. Um, but just before you jump off this slide, um, Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about the wood that was used in there? What species and where you got it from? Oh, well, see, this again, this is what my team does for me. I, <laughs> I think I think some of it is black butt and um, oh, there's another one, uh, iron bark. Those are, the, those are the two timber types that we've used. Um, one thing I have noticed that, that you need to use uh, material that's well seasoned because uh, some of these uh, do drip tannins, especially if you're working over, I mean, it's not so much a problem in the lily pond, but if we're using it in uh, an urban space with pavements around it, you might want to take some care with that. Excellent, thanks for that. So again, I encourage people to put some questions in the Q&A box, but we might just now hand over to uh, to Luke, so thanks for that, Jerry. Luke, if you want to fire up your presentation. Sure thing, okay. Uh, let me know when that's sharing. Yep, we can see your presentation. Not sure you, you, your, your, um, or your video might um, be muted. That's there it. There you go, see me now. Yep. Perfect, yep. thanks for that, over to you. Great, well, thanks, Alistair, for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. And, and thanks, Jerry, that was a really inspiring presentation. Um, so hi everybody, I'm here to talk to you today um, about a project that's really close to my heart, um, Terrigal Boardwalk and Rockpool. So I'd just like to start um, with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters where this project is located on the central coast, the Darkingen people. And I also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, um, whose country I'm speaking on today um, from our, our Sydney office. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognize their continuing connection and contribution to the land and waters that we live and work on. Um, and I'd also like to extend my respect to any Aboriginal people who may be in attendance here today. So Terrigal Boardwalk, um, many of you may be familiar with um, the, the, the town of Terrigal on the central coast of New South Wales. Um, it's the most stunning um, environment, the most beautiful natural coastline um, and an ancient place. Um, the boardwalk itself uh, was commissioned by the Central Coast Council um, and is a collaborative design effort um, across Arab's planning and design team. And for anyone that doesn't know who we are, we, we're comprised of architects, landscape architects, urban designers and strategic planners. Um, we work very much in collaboration um, with the engineers at Arab. Uh, the contractor was Land and Marine. Um, and I want to call out um, in particular Rod Pangeli, who was the timber specialist from Coastal Hardwoods, who was just um, a wealth of knowledge on this project and uh, really fundamental in helping us specify um, and detail the timber that was used. So the primary objective of the project was to enable equitable access to all visitors uh, between two beaches, Terrigal Beach and the Haven. Um, historically, these had been disconnected um, and, and poorly connected. Um, you had to walk up a, a steep cliff or along a road um, and, and people wanting to get between the beaches um, either had to make the dash across the rocks, um, which were liable to, to erosion and rockfall, um, or, or walk up around the roadside. So it's been an issue for, um, ter uh, for Central Coast Council for some time and one that they've had on their radar. So the boardwalk itself um, is comprised of a 227 meter long raised walkway. Um, and it also includes the restoration of the rock pool, which you can see on the bottom right hand corner of that photo. Um, that rock pool has um, an access ramp down into it. And, and I believe is one of the few um, man-made rock pools um, along the coast of New South Wales, which um, is fully accessible. Um, and these rock pools and swimming pools have become such um, a defining feature of, of our coastline. Um, so the, the main benefits that the project provided um, were creating that safe and equitable access between the two beaches. 
um, really leveraging the natural and beautiful natural environment um, and creating health benefits for people um, cycling, walking, jogging, making their way along that um, boardwalk. And it also has a real effect of reinvigorating the local economy, drawing tourists in and really promoting the area which relies so heavily on tourism. Um, and I should mention as well that that was obviously very heavily impacted during COVID and, and there was a real decline in visitors to the area. And a lot of the feedback we've had since the boardwalk has been built um, from local businesses um, has been that this has been a real draw. And sure, if you um, if you type Terrigal Boardwalk into Instagram or any other social media channel, you'll find lots of people um, taking photos of this place. So conceptually, the, the boardwalk is really conceived as an extension to the natural sandstone coastline. Um, and as such, it meanders closely um, to the natural rock form. Um, the, the, the boardwalk edges are, are, are gently um, curved uh, to, to mimic the, the, the wave action on the sandstone itself. Um, and whilst this is um, quite a, uh, a heavy piece of, of infrastructure, there's a lot of engineering required to help this thing stand up to storms being in a very exposed location. Um, we worked really hard with our engineering colleagues to make sure that this was a really sensitive integration um, and something that worked in harmony with the natural coastline. So just zooming into one of the key features of the project, um, we have this lookout about halfway along um, the boardwalk itself. So you can see that there is this timber decking on the actual walkway itself, but that changes um, to an FRP mesh over the lookout. And, and the intent there was to further enhance the experience and the sense of connection to the landscape and to the water. So you, you literally feel the, the ocean breeze coming through that. You can see and hear the water on the rocks below. Um, but we also wanted to limit that use of FRP, um, which is so often seen on these kinds of boardwalks and really um, capitalize on the opportunity um, to specify as much hardwood as we could. So you can see here, looking towards the lookout, uh, the use of timber is quite extensive. Um, it's really concentrated on the, on the, um, on, on the walkway and on the uh, top rail balustrade. And some of the reasons why we decided to use timber, because it's not always um, the most straightforward process with some clients to, to get timber over the line, but we really worked hard to demonstrate the benefits that it would bring, particularly around the project being in a very natural setting. Um, and the experience people have of walking along this coastline is, is often done barefoot. Um, and so, you know, your feet touch the boardwalk, your hand touches the top rail, and you really have that sense of, of warmth um, and the kind of connection to nature. Um, the other thing to note as well is that being in an exposed setting, um, the surface of any material gets extremely hot and timber is just an incredibly good um, material when it comes to um, touch and feel um, and just regulating its own heat. And um, from a sustainability perspective, of course, timber is um, really a, a no brainer. And, um, you know, compared to some of the materials that are commonly used on these kinds of projects, um, you know, the extensive use of concrete and, and NFRP and stainless steel has much lower embodied carbon. Um, and I believe the talk that was given um, last week, the precursor talk to this one really went into detail on, on the, uh, the carbon benefits of the use of timber. So I encourage you to go back and watch that one if you can. Um, I think the other thing about timber is it is a, it's a locally readily available material in Australia, and there are many forestries that are able to provide this timber. Um, from a maintenance and perspective point of view, um, you know, it, it is a re it lends itself very well um, to uh, to being repaired. So if it's chipped or damaged, um, it can be repaired locally um, without sort of having to lift everything up and replace it. Um, and I think one of the things we really uh, worked with Central Coast Council to, to understand was just the, the benefit around the natural aging process of the timber, the fact that it would turn grey over time, um, that it would crack in places, um, and, and that it would start to um, become worn where people most um, used it and touched it. So those were things that we saw as real attributes and just part of this project bedding down in the landscape. Okay. So just zooming into the, the deck itself, um, you know, we, we had so much input um, from Rod on this um, in terms of specifying the right kind of timber. So we used a, a seasoned um, black butt timber uh, for the decking. Um, spotted gum was an option, um, but the, the black butt's actually qu quite a lot. Um, it has a real economic benefit. Um, so we limited the use of spotted gum to the top rail where you're actually physically touching it. Um, 
So the, the timber specified was uh, had a durability class one rating um, and an F27 structural grade rating for anyone who uh, is interested in that side of things. Um, so it's incredibly hard wearing um, and, and meets all um, the, the requirements that it needs to. Um, the timber planks um, are tapered as they navigate around the corners and that really just gives that sense of um, sort of continued uh, walkway uh, rather than a kind of stop start approach that you might get if you just use planks that were all the same width. Um, so there was some expense involved with that but we limited the number of tapered planks sort of locally around um, the corners. The timber is open jointed and rainwater drops directly onto um, the timber um, decking beneath, oh, sorry, the, the concrete decking beneath, um, and then it's returned um, to the ocean. So one of the questions that often comes up is well, why did we put timber on top of what was a, a concrete um, deck? Um, why did we need to have, you know, is that a double up? Um, and my response to that is that one of the key drivers um, for this project is um, is making sure that it's incredibly durable. And I mentioned already that it gets pretty hard hit during the winter storms. Um, so we wanted to limit any services to the underside of the structure. And you can see that photo on the bottom right there, uh, where you've got an incredibly clean um, and service free underside of the concrete deck. Um, now that's because all the services, so there's water and there is um, electrical conduits running along the top surface that's then capped by the timber. Um, the timber just also is a really nice surface to be able to walk and run on and it's, it's so naturally springy um, and, and a, a really good material for that. So that little detail you're seeing there is showing the timber interface with the concrete and with the um, stainless steel balustrade. Um, the timber is actually fixed to FRP joists so that little square member you see sitting directly under the timber is a, is a piece of FRP. That was selected for its durability um, and, and for the way that it takes a screw, um, <clears throat> which is, um, you know, it, it just holds onto that screw really well. Um, and we also spent quite a bit of time specifying the screw, getting into the real details of this. And these are stainless steel spack screws um, that are incredibly hard wearing um, and are able to um, go through timber into FRP. Um, they've also got this security um, head to them. So the next place we, we used um, timber was this top rail. Um, so this is a kind of custom designed piece of, uh, of timber of, of spotted gum. Um, again, um, so that this is um, a seasoned piece of, uh, of timber and um, it's, it's actually been treated with, a, with an oil, um, but that requires very little maintenance. Um, you can see that there's been a groove um, CNC'd into the underside um, of that balustrade and that's to accommodate an LED light fitting that um, achieves our luminance levels on the top surface of the deck but also really just tucks it away and, and hides it out the way so that all you're seeing is the timber. Um, one thing I thought was really interesting and this is through collaboration with the, the contractor and our timber expert was you can see on the actual photo there there is a groove that has been saw cut into the left hand side of that timber top rail it doesn't exist on our drawing and it was something that was introduced um, advised uh, by our timber expert um, and that was around um, trying to get the, both sides of that timber top rail um, a similar mass um, and the reason for that is that if you've got a very different mass on one side in comparison to the other, you're very susceptible to cupping, which is the distortion of the timber as the, as the timber um, either dries or absorbs water during different climates. So there were, there were little learnings like that along the way that <clears throat> just, um, you know, we, we didn't pick up on, but, um, but were, were advised to us by the timber experts. So definitely recommend bringing in people with the know-how. Um, So here's some more shots of that timber top rail. Um, the timber um, was installed um, in, in four to six meter lengths. Um, the corner pieces were, were shorter um, and, and installed in shorter strips. Um, and in that bottom right image, this is looking up at the underside of that timber top rail. You can see a very clean connection between the stainless steel and the timber, and then the very thin gap for the LED light fitting. And here's a night shot of the uh, the boardwalk um, from the air. So um, you can really see the timber, the warmth of the timber just growing. It was really clear in comparison to the FRP on that outlook, just how warm and inviting that timber looks. Um, so we're really pleased with the outcome from that. And then 
off the back of this project, we've actually um, undertaken a number of other um, uh, commissions in marine environments. And I just wanted to make note of a really exciting project that we're working on, which is the Kame Ferry Wharves project in Botany Bay. And this is the reinstatement of two wharves on either side of the bay, linking up La Perouse and Cornell. Um, again, it's a collaboration between Arab's uh, planning and design team and maritime team. So, you know, an, an engineered solution, but with um, real consideration of the human experience. Um, and, and in this project in particular, a, a, a real connecting with country focus as we work very closely with the La Perouse Local Aboriginal Land Council and the um, uh, Gajaga Foundation, um, who, are, who are really advising us and guiding the design on this project. Um, so again, this project builds off the experience that we gained um, over at Terrigal and has a similar top rail detail. It uses timber decking um, throughout, um, but it also includes a number of um, bespoke um, timber furniture elements as well. So again, we first stop was to bring in a timber expert and we were working very closely with them to develop the design for the, the flooring, the top rail and those, um, those timber furniture pieces um, that are kind of custom designed and um, with the right care and maintenance will last a long, long time and provide just a really beautiful experience for the people coming to visit this wharf. So that's that's me. I'll leave it there and hand back over to you, Alistair. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Another excellent presentation. So some, some really incredible projects happening at the moment. Uh, but we've, we've got some questions coming in, which is great, and certainly encourage those um, yeah, online to uh, to add some more questions to the mix there. I might just leave it on the screen just at the moment so people can see us all while we, we do this. Um, so, um, Jerry, a question here from um, from Ryan Lucy. Yeah. Um, are there growing concerns or issues with timber supply at the moment uh, in the Tasmanian supply chain? If so, is this impacting, affecting on the design solutions and outcomes of your work? Yeah, at the moment there are there are supply chain issues in terms of availability uh, that have led to some pretty significant increase in costs. Um, about which we have to be smarter about how we use timber and where we use it and which species we're selecting. Uh, if I could, I'd just look comment on uh, the the previous presentation. I thought when I saw that extra uh, groove in your timber. Uh, I was thinking that it uh, looked that it that it was a drip cove because I think the other value in those two grooves either side is that it the drip cove aspect means that the water isn't getting between the steel and the timber, which is where you you know potentially do do have failure in timber systems uh, where there's that trapped moisture for long periods of time. So anything we can do to shape those railings, shape those kind of elements, uh, get the water off is an important thing. And that might be one answer to Sonia's question here about uh, specification of timber. So anyway, yeah, that's my response to the supply chain question. <laughs> okay, she just uh, jumped to Sonia's question there. She did um, just uh, mention about um, specifying spotted gum previously, and she's got their understanding with the species was a class two timber. So, so actually spotted gum is a class two timber for in-ground application. It's a class one timber for above ground application. So when we look at those natural durability classes, there's those two different situations, whether it's physically in the ground where it's got moisture around it all the time, and it's obviously its expected life will be less than in an above ground application like a handrail or decking or a cladding uh, where timber might be sort of, uh, sorry, the timber might get sort of temporarily wet, but it's not in, in wet all the time. Um, so yeah, as a class two in ground, it does have a lifespan, but around that sort of 15 plus years as a, cla as a class one above ground, it should be a lot longer than that. So I'd yeah, be interested in chatting with you, Sonia, later. If you want to contact us, we might be able to help you a little bit more about an issue you might have there. And again, um, over the next two uh, weeks, um, uh, which is a good little segue into that, um, we'll have Jeff Morell next week talking all about natural durability. So we'll be specifically talking about a lot of these topics. So it'll be a good one, Sonia, there to raise again next week. And then the week after that, um, talking about timber preservation and external finishing. Um, so, um, yeah, just a um, uh, question here. Sorry, um, I'll just come finish off the lily pad ones questions, Luke, and then we'll jump onto your project. Um, Melanie's mentioned, uh, Jerry, love the way the lily pads make visitors part of the landscape. Looking from across the ponds, people on the lower deck appear to be floating on the lily pads with the ducks swimming nearby. Um, it, it really is an interesting, beautiful project there. Uh, 
Um, Jared, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that at all. Uh, thanks, Mel. I appreciate that. We always appreciate compliments. Um, one thing I'm uh, listening to, again, listening to Luke's conversation, uh, I didn't talk much about any of the technical things about the decking, but um, when you went around that curve, it reminded me that in our situation, we worked out a way of taking the board and cutting it on an angle to create two identical pieces that helped us go around the curve. So we could get, we minimized waste. We used computer, it was all computer cut uh, so that every piece was precisely the same, but we were able to make that curve and make the, and make all the things line up because we were using uh, one singular dimension of timber to make all the various pieces of the of the decking. The, the uprights are all 35 square timber. So that was one thing. And yeah, and I, and I think we benefited in our case, uh, and probably you might have as well, Luke, we benefited from the fact that one of the one of the guys working on the project was a boat builder. So he had a, a real sense of the craft personship that needs to go into it. And in fact, we started with a concrete deck underneath ours because we wanted to be able to crane it in and drop it in and you know sort of minimize construction costs. But the builder said, no, we can do it just as quickly and easily out of timber and we've got the skills. And to be to their credit, Macquarie builders took their price way down because they wanted to build the project as a they had an affinity for the gardens. They wanted to make sure it happened and it happened beautifully. So uh, congratulations to them as well. Luke, we had a, I've got a, um, a, comp or a question here. I love uh, Luke, love the details to reduce mass and cupping. As I understand, the timber, especially unseasoned, will continue to achieve moisture equilibrium to the site, uh, hence introducing additional cracks and checks after installation. Is there any reasonable approach to reduce or control the shrinkage? Yeah, so, so like I said, we were guided you know, a lot by our timber expert and you know, the, the, introduce, the introduction of that um, saw cut groove um, was certainly around reducing um, cupping and distortion and, and and Jerry really good point I think absolutely to, as, a, as a drip as well um, yeah so 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 I may have said the wrong thing but it's, it, it was seasoned in in this case so um, you know it, it I think that reduces um, the amount of cracking that you'll see and typically with, with this one so the, as it's seasoned some of the pieces that are um, demonstrating really big cracks um, are actually pushed to one side and, and the ones that are actually installed on site are the ones with the with the smaller cracks so you know we're already starting out with timber that we know um, is not as susceptible to these really deep cracks that the smaller cracks we don't actually aren't too worried about it's more about getting your finger stuck in a, in a, in a deeper one um, I think the other thing to mention as well is just the the length of the timber elements was obviously partly due, due to kind of structural grid that we had, but also around, um, you know, enabling um, expansion and contraction. And there was a 25 mil joint between those timber elements, which is quite big. Um, but that was really just to allow for that movement. And, and we expected a lot of that to happen. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that they're all really good points. And, and, and to add a little bit to your comments you made there, um, yeah, I mean, one of the most important things we tell architects all the time, whether it's a landscape architect externally or internally, is uh, to be aware of that um, moisture content that you put in the product into. So um, it, it's exactly right. I mean, uh, timber is a hydroscopic material that takes up and gives off moisture depending on the amount of moisture in the air. So um, you know, traditionally, when you, you harvest a tree, it's, it's, it's I think more than 100% actually when you do the calculation full of water because there's actually water coming out of it. And then that air dries down to a certain percentage as the water in the pores dries out and then you kiln dry it to actually dry the water within the, the vessels of the, of the timber. So generally, um, kiln dried timbers down around sort of 12 to 14 percent is what the industry would be trying to hit. So, uh, you know, internally, it might be going into a moisture content less than that. So you do need to acclimatise it. But obviously, with landscaping, it's probably going to a moisture content, you know, higher than that and variable. So, yeah, but the fact that it will sort of um, expand and contract means you will get um, some ongoing um, checking. It's often called the, the smaller cracks rather than the physical larger cracks. But but that is a natural part of the material. So it is an important part of your specification to understanding the, yeah, what moisture content that timber comes in at and what it's going to actually be in practice. And, and we get, we'll chat more about that over the next couple of weeks and you'll get some advice on, on that. Mm. I, I asked a question around that um, and I'm not, I don't, uh, it's a technical question. 
is air dried material less likely to develop some of those problems compared with kiln dried material? Because I, you know, you hear people say, "Oh, killed dry," you know, uh, as a as a comment. And and the other thing I would say about cupping and checking, as I understand it, uh, is that it depends on how the boards are cut from the log in the first place. Uh, and I don't remember the language, but I think it's something to do with you know radial cut versus. Uh, the, 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 so the, the, the two ways of radial cutting is actually a slightly different way to do it, which some people do, but the boards are either back sawn or quarter sawn. So it uh, depends how it comes out of the log, if it's cut across, if it's back sawn, if it's cut out in sort of quarters, it comes out quarter sawn. But you're exactly right, Jerry, um, that they will each sort of move it in, in a different way. And again, that'll be covered off over the next couple of weeks, uh, exactly that discussion. Um, but you're also right, Jerry. Uh, it's really important, um, particularly with hardwoods, when they're harvested, that that air drying process is done in a controlled and slow way. A little bit like the old crock pot we talk about, you know, that uh, always tastes better if it's been in the crock pot for a long time. But uh, yeah, you, you don't want to dry hardwoods initially in that air drying phase too quickly, otherwise they will twist and, and check. It's different with pine. Uh, for pine, you can actually dry very quickly. You know, I mean, almost a week you can get a log in and you can produce a bit of season material out. But with hardwoods, often that air drying process, depending on the species, could be anything from six to 12 months. So it's one of the problems, again, why uh, uh, with a hardwood resource, you can't actually get that quickly. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of air drying stock sitting out there drying very slowly to ensure you minimise the amount of checking. Um, in that actual final air, um, kiln drying process, uh, if, if the if the material has been air dried properly to that point, you actually do get less checking involved there. And again, it, it is quite dependent on species. Different species will, will check in different ways. Mm. Actually, a good question here, uh, Luke um, Mauricio has asked, uh, Luke, you mentioned a good negotiation um, with council to convince them of the material selection, um, hardwood versus the all steel option. What was the main argument you used to convince the council as well as understanding timber being more sustainable, but councils are really uh, apprehensive to use it. Would have been interesting to know how your company convinced them. Yeah, yeah, good question, Maritza. So yeah, we um we did have quite a, a lengthy conversation about the use of timber, and, and and you know there were certain factions that were you know worried about the maintenance aspect of it and and the durability access uh, aspect of it. So um you know there's all, at that point in the project, always things come up like are people going to use it as a chopping board to kind of cut up their sandwiches or the fish that they've just caught, or you know there's all kinds of things like that. But honestly, it was and I, I guess this is a bit of a stock standard answer, but it, it was about taking them on the journey and and really um, helping them understand why timber was going to be such an asset to the project in terms of you know the, the, the fact that it, it was going to be in a very natural setting that it wasn't appropriate to be using lots of steel and concrete um, really on show in a place like this um, you know and then I think it was about putting their minds at ease that we'd got the right experts in to to specify it correctly and, and really understand what maintenance looked like so one of the things is that it's it's not um, you know, it's not varnished or coated in any way. Um, I think the top rail's got a bit of oil on it, but um, other than that, there is there's no sort of ongoing maintenance requirement. It's not like you've got to strip it back every few years and repaint it or something. So, so that that was definitely helpful um, in terms of getting them over the line on it. Um, those are probably the main ones. I think, yeah, also just the point around like, um, you know, if it sort of cracks or chips, like you can actually sand it back and, and, and either fill it or replace a, a section of it. Um, and, and I think just, you know, pointing out some other projects, we we really leveraged a couple of projects. There was one up in Noosa that had used um, timber quite extensively on a boardwalk. We weren't actually able to take them up there because it was all during COVID, but just to be able to show them photos of that and have them speak to the timber supplier from that project and, um, you know, talk a lot around um, how it ages and, the, the, you know, setting the expectation that it is going to change colour and it is going to grey. So, you know, we don't need to go out there and specify something on day one that we, we think is going to stay like that forever, but we're really thinking around what it's going to look like in a few years' time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, lots of conversations. I think there was two good points you made, in particular in your presentation and in our discussions previously. Well, one was about getting good advice, you know, about uh, from timber specialists to make sure you've got the right product and the right application. And the other thing, obviously, about managing the customer's expectation, just, um, you know, you, you want to make sure they understand what's going to happen. And, uh, and particularly on the graying of timber, which which clearly is a perfect application in, you know, the, the boardwalk setting you've got, you know, where, where it sort of matches in with the sand dunes and things. But often the client, you know, is expecting the timber to look like they, the first day it was laid for the, the next 10 years. And, uh, you know, you can get that, but you need to finish it and get the maintenance right. So that managing expectation was important. I imagine that's a similar thing you do with all the time as well, Jerry. 
Did you just throw to me? Sorry, I was dangerous. <laughs> I imagine that's something that you deal with a lot as well about the managing the expectation. But I was actually going to ask with, um, um, interestingly, that the question was asked there about um, the carbon side of things with the client, if that was uh, that sustainability um, uh, message w w was sort of resonating. Um, I mean, I'm keen to get both of you feed bits of feedback on that, this and even people online. Did you find with landscape architects that the embodied carbon impact of materials is now sort of very much front of mind? Definitely in the... In internally and with building structures it, it's just absolutely sort of the focus at the moment so uh, from a sort of life cycle assessment point of view you know the building sector was very focused on operational energy for many years like almost probably 10 or 15 years now there's a huge focus on the embodied impact of materials up front and the circular economy argument about what happens at end of life is that something that your clients in the landscape sector are aware of and, and the selling point for us I don't think it's always coming from the client. It's certainly, if we're not using it up front as an argument, it's certainly in the back of our mind. Um, we're trying to reduce our uh, reliance on concrete in particular, where the, the vast bulk of carbon is uh, carbon intense construction is. Um, timber is obviously one solution, doesn't do some of the heavy lifting that concrete obviously does. So uh, we're using more natural stone in a lot of places, or we're using uh, cut stone, we're using clay pavers as, as alternatives, just trying to reduce the amount of concrete. And just looking at really considering the need for some of the elements that we might have once built. So again, looking at you know low retaining walls. Well, can we, do we need that? Can we increase the slope on the ground? Are there other alternatives to building those retaining walls that might've had concrete blocks in them or might have had concrete in them. So just always questioning how we're, how, what we're using and using the right material for the right uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was, I was interested also, Jerry, just in your presentation about some of the people that inspired you. Um, you know, you're mentioning of uh, Richard Lepastria, who's obviously, you know, a, a real sort of expert in the timber for many years. But uh, just even back then when you were speaking to him about um, his demountable structures, so certainly well ahead of his time, you know, designed for deconstruction is the other big message out there at the moment from a circular yeah. economy perspective. But uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, luckily they haven't had to take Wombat apart, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a beautiful building all these years on. I think it's had one round of maintenance where the team got back together and touched it up and did a few things to it. But it's still a really important piece of the Botanic Garden story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been around now for 40 years and uh, a great asset. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what Richard was saying about don't use nails. You know, yeah. he was talking about screws and the <laughs> ability to take things apart and put them back together. He was talking about, uh, you know, natural jointing. I mean, he's a he lived in Japan for a long time and, and was as an aficionado of the way they put things together without any, uh, you know, screws or nails that, you know, it's all in the timber and the way it works. Mm, but you, you'd have to know your way around a saw for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke, we had a question here just on, um, on the, um, the decking coating. Are the tim is the timber decking all coated with a slip resistant coating? Are there any issues with slipping during frost or winter times? Yeah, so the the decking itself is uncoated, so it's just it's just natural. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly slip braiding it achieves, but presumably it has to meet some sort of compliance there. So, yeah, I, I sorry, I probably can't share too much more on that. May have to sort of come back to you on that one. But uh, yeah, I know it's not got any coating or treating treatment on it. Um, um, so we, yeah, we're not expecting any any issues with that. Um, but yeah, in an environment where it's often going to be wet, um, then you know, I, I guess it's one to to be keeping front of mind. And there might be others on the call or uh, who who may have other points of view there. But yeah, for us, it was just completely untreated. And then there's I can see the second question there as well is around the treatment of the uh, oiling on the top rail, and you know, a lot of that was just around um, you know initially at any rate. Um, uh, I, I suppose just a, a treatment that would protect it somewhat from from some from UV, but also um, it, it, yeah, it keeps it a little bit more flexible. But it's not something that we had um, we, we were advised that would need to be sort of replenished regularly. It was it was more of a sort of you know you coat it and then you let it just gently weather in. Mm. 
Uh, I did sort of note with your comment also about the sort of substructure of the um, of the boardwalk that it was concrete and uh, um, about the lower maintenance that required, which was really good, good important point. I mean, well, we often remind people that all materials require maintenance, so even the concrete's going to require maintenance at some point, just a steel wheel. So it really is about managing the client's expectations about how often the maintenance needs to occur to ensure you get that that long that longevity from the project. Look, we're just. Um, on the, on the hour now, so that's been fantastic. Uh, really, sort of thank you both for your presentations and for your your, your wise insight into uh, in, into the projects you've been uh, um, underway with. Um, I just remind the people that attending today that the um, webinars are all recorded, so you will be able to access this from Edward Solutions website uh, um, shortly. Um, and also remind you that this was the second of five um, uh, webinars in the series. So next week, um, uh, we've got the timber durability one, which I'll chat about shortly. But please feel free to register with the other um, webinars coming up if you haven't done already. So next week on the 12th of April, we're very fortunate to have um, Professor Jess Burrells, who's one of the world leading experts actually in durability. He now heads up our National Centre for Timber Durability and Design Life. He's just been over in the States recently visiting his family and talking with his colleagues, but he'll be back uh, next week. So timber durability probably is one of the, I suppose, most important topics of this, this webinar series. So we really encourage you to, uh, to register and attend uh, that one. So thanks once again, everyone. Thanks once again, Jerry and Luke, and um, look, look forward to seeing all of those who can make it again next week. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Luke. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye.